I'm Sebastian, and I want to talk about um, programmable telecoms, which is apparently hard. So this was the title we, we aligned with Ellen. Um, a while ago, it's a bit of a meta title. Um, it's, again, about my kind of attempts or attempts that uh, I did with a uh, few people to change telecoms from within. And um, I've been until recently uh, employed with Immer, which was a startup funded by DT. I'll shortly talk what it's about, um, talk about our achievements. Um, We've been closed down by now. I moved back to, to DT now. And um, yeah, I just want to give you a few uh, lessons learned in the course of the last year. So it's the third time I present basically the, the Immer story. Um, shortly about me, I have, um, yeah, I'm with Telco for quite a while. Actually, my entire uh, professional, professional life. I worked for 10 years in uh, Slovak Telecom in Bratislava. I uh, did their core network design, development, innovation, uh, worked on WebRTC in the end, not the classic telco use cases, but a bit, let's say, um, specific one. Moved then to work for Immer uh, in 2016, where I was uh, for two and a half years responsible for the engineering team. And since uh, October, I work for um, Deutsche Telekom. Um, I'm presenting today kind of my personal view, so that's neither the view of Immer nor the view of DT. It's my own take um, out, of the, out of the Immer story, so that's what it's about. Um, if you have connections to my Twitter, LinkedIn, if you want to connect with me, I have a link here about the Immer technology stack that might be of interest, what we used um, to produce Immer very shortly about it. If you don't know what it is or was, um, it was a Deutsche Telekom funded startup. Um, Deutsche Telekom acted as strategic investor. So they had certain goals that I wanted to achieve with Immer. Um, it was created out of an internal project by the end of uh, 2015. We were established as a company. I joined in the beginning of 2016 and we were uh, closed down in August uh, 2018. Um, and what we tried to do was essentially mesh up um, traditional carrier voice with 21st century voice and video to create new communication experiences. And we did um, not do this in the classic way that, where you could say, well, carrier networks transition to IP and you put something intelligent on front of this IP carrier network infrastructure. Uh, but are still limited kind of, of the carrier protocol stack. But what we did is we connected the back end to the carrier stack essentially and did a proprietary um, client server integration to um, be able to differentiate as we would um, like to do. So not to be kind of bound by the restrictions of the, uh, of the standard protocols. Um, yeah, long term participant at TED Hack at TED Summit. I've presented here at Slovak Telecom, then at Immer. And now I want to share my view. So, what are our achievements actually at Immer? Well, in the course of these two and a half years, uh, we launched three applications. Uh, the first one was kind of as we started, uh, a branded service called Immer. Um, we integrated that one with uh, carrier core network infrastructure in Slovak Telecom. Um, so we were essentially sitting on top of the uh, legacy stack. They, back then, they did not have yet an IP stack to integrate with. We were connecting there on certain points. We were connecting to the STP to take control over the calls. We were connecting to the uh, SIP trunks, uh, SMS infrastructure to essentially um, build on top of um, these, these carrier assets with the least integration effort possible. Um, because that actually worked and we launched a service end of uh, 16, um, DT decided that it's not the best idea to do all of that in all of the countries as a separate brand, but to actually say we do a Magenta brand. So we were uh, transforming Immer uh, to the DT branded service Magenta Talk. Last year I was kind of announcing that, I couldn't say the name yet, but I was saying we're doing a branded version for DT. Um, we were including here customer lifecycle, so in, in the IT systems, uh, we had an end-to-end -end monitoring in there, so it was quite an, uh, also a lot of learnings out of the, let's say, ordinary, um, yeah, carrier core infrastructure project where you would learn. Uh, we relaunched that as well as a beta in the same market end of 2017. Um, and um, after that, what I announced last year to kind of bring the best of both worlds from carrier as well as um, Differentiating infrastructure there, we, we did a lot in our staging environment, we never came to show it, but we did essentially integrate also on the back end with the voice of LT stack in our lab. We integrated with, um, with RCS as well, it's kind of a thing you gotta do <laughs> when you do such a service for a carrier, but it, it, it was fine, essentially it was a bit of a win-win. So with the app you could call into Volta, you had the benefits of a high definition codec, fast call setup time. In RCS you could kind of share rich Immer content with RCS, you could receive it. So you essentially broadened the, the ecosystems without having the dependency on the pre-installed um, stacks in the devices. That was pretty good. Um, we did as well launch our own standalone service uh, called Orbit, which we did as a trial in the UK. End of 2017, um, it was a use case-driven multi-numbering proposition 
um, uh, where we in the end also, so the first two we did with the, with the Candy IO stack from, from Ribbon Communications. For the last one, we essentially replaced that in our last, uh, let's say, weeks with an open source, um, uh, yeah, component based uh, CPaaS infrastructure, if you wish. Um, and one of the achievements was as well that it was a compliant production of a telco service in the cloud, which is pretty interesting. So if you're DT, of course, you have your privacy and security um, rules that also apply for, for companies you own, so it applied to us. But we were actually able to pass that PSA process and to run it off the AWS public cloud um, and had all kind of relevant data there, customer data as well. So it was all, it was all uh, compliant, which is one of the achievements as well that I think is quite important to highlight. So what happened? Why have we been shut down? Um, yeah, it kind of we, we discussed with Alan, we, we talked about it doing some kind of SWOT analysis. Um, I try to do that very briefly. Um, of course, there's a certain bias in it, um, but um, I try to look at it a bit from, from yeah, to, to get also something out of it. So what were our strengths? I would say we had a solid um, technology concept. We had uh, built up a lot of expertise. So getting actually developers there, getting designers there, getting product people there who understand um, apps on the internet, but who also understand carriers, who understand Carrier communications or communication in the context of a carrier um, was quite hard, but we, we, we really did well there, I would say. Um, we had a very good strategic partnership with DT, so we could essentially in the market where we launched in Slovakia, we could integrate there. They gave us access to their assets. Um, it was really um, yeah, quite, uh, quite positive. We had solid financing. It's a, with a strategic invest, it's a bit different than when you have a VC, who's kind of always very pushy. Um, DT was of course also pushy in, in that we fulfill our goals, but it was, um, I would say, less um, yeah, fragile than, than a VC invest could be. Uh, what were the weaknesses? I would say, uh, f first and foremost, uh, wrong expectation management uh, that we did towards the many stakeholders we got over time. Um, our targets and missions kind of uh, adjusted a bit, but we never really um, we never really followed up. If you remember the previous slide, um, where we had a first a kind of a white label internet service and then a carrier service, we kind of still had expectations for both um, in, in, in the last product. So you should, on one hand, um, get a lot of users, but on the other hand, not really be too disruptive, but just supplementary. So this was a thing we did not, I would say, manage well. It was fine uh, to be asked uh, to do that, but we, we should have managed it better and in the end adjusted a bit the expectations. Um, opportunities were, let's say, um, a lot of market learnings. We were quite late there. Um, a lot of other carriers tried this before in a bit different ways, I would say. But nevertheless, having um, yeah, web-based communication or multi-device communication not being based on the carrier stack has been done before. So we could use these learnings and actually uh, benefit from it. Um, there was a lot of interest uh, in DT actually to work with us. So we did a cool project. Uh, we were almost on a, on a green field. Um, and we could, of course, do many things that um, their technical people may be able to, to do, but they got different requirements than we got. So that was pretty good. And um, in the end, it was also part of the strategy in DT. Magenta Talk is a kind of differentiating supplement to the otherwise, I would say, more standard-driven um, green button strategy. Um, yeah, threats. Um, in, inside DT, we had a fluctuation of, um, of, of stakeholders that, so we had some stakeholders and others came in with different targets. And one of the big things, that's also why I highlighted this next to the expectation management, was actually that we were touching the core business, and uh, that's telephony and, and, uh, and, and SMS, and that's not really trivial in the carrier context. Um, if you do something with IPTV or one of these new businesses, it's always, let's say, easy to try out new things because um, there is less risk of, of risking this kind of um, legacy revenues that, that you have just because the service evolves from a telephony. Um, but with, uh, with, uh, with voice and, and, and messaging, it was really kind of a sensitive, t sensitive topic here and there. And that also shaped kind of the expectations a bit. Um, I'll come to that a bit later. So what happened? So mainly uh, coming back to these two points, uh, stakeholders' expectations. So um, essentially, as I said, we were funded uh, with the idea to be in disruptive internet service that also worked, but then the mission kind of evolved and we never really um, yeah, got, got, um, uh, yeah, got, that, got the expectations properly adjusted. So that was a fault on our side, I would say. Um, it was a, a bit of a catch-22. So as I said, the product should work like comparable apps. So you would compare it with WhatsApp, with Viber, of course, although it was, it was completely different. But that never, nevertheless, it, it was compared with this. And on the other hand, it should work exactly as telephony. So when a call drops in the app, 
even though there was a simple explanation and it was even working as expected and we even talked about it before it was still kind of these these two things th to to bring these two things together and to manage to manage it in from from the expectation of the stakeholders was really was really difficult and and we tried it but we <laughs> essentially also did not fully succeed with it um and yeah, last point that uh, the uh, quality of the app, let's say, was was perceived as as not really that good, and the chat always a bit light overall. So even if technically everything works, if you have if you have issues here and there, if you have crashes, uh, there's always somebody coming saying carrier grade um, should be carrier grade. We don't launch products with bugs, and and that essentially um, holds you back a bit. Um, the other thing regarding user expectations. Um, uh, let's say um, it's it's quite hard when a legacy service all of a sudden behaves differently. Um, if I would do it again now, I would say multi-device should start with looking at the secondary and third device and to shape the experience there, making your primary device behave different, so your main phone um, behave different is a thing that is hard to explain to users. Um, we, we got that feedback and we, we also realized it um, ourselves. Um, there was a bit of a complexity in activating it, usually when you download an app, you can subscribe to premium, you press a button, you pay in the app store or you whatever, you have an account already that gives you access to, 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 to the content. We had to integrate with the Telco IT flow. So essentially we needed to do an, an IT activation that we did, I, I would say, not um, not properly hide from the user. So there was a bit of a, of a, it was not, this activation was a bit more Telco than app-like. So this was, an, I would say, an issue for upgrading. Uh, and if you didn't upgrade the app, it would essentially be uh, yeah, uh, looking like WhatsApp uh, because you couldn't really uh, use the benefits that, that it offered to you. And that again then led to the perception that why do, do we launch something that is um, not, not even as good as WhatsApp, although that was not the, 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 the frame of reference we, we wanted to be compared with. Um, and in the end, uh, yeah, mix of minute and data pricing. So of course, um, we, 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 tried to, we tried to make the service as less integrated as possible. We didn't zero rate data. And, and if you would call over best effort internet um, with your plan, this is a good thing because you can use your plan, but you would also consume data. And it was kind of hard to explain why a call essentially costs more because you consume minutes and, and data. And we never got around this, but this was a minor issue, I would say. That's just a thing that if I would do it again, again, I would look for for giving the customer segment um, that we're addressing also a benefit, um, a benefit here. Um, yeah, now uh, learnings of the past uh, two years, I would rather um, say we talk about uh, lessons learned in the course of 2018. I put here again the links from 16 and, and, and 17. Um, I've, I've spoken a lot about Emory, about our tech stacks. So I really want to look at what got wrong um, since the promising outlook that I presented. Uh, last year. Um, uh, long story short, um, these are just a few points that you can kind of get an understanding of the of the less than a year time frame. So last year I presented here um, at uh, in, in Lisbon, talked about the Magenta talk, beta launch, uh, said we will launch Orbit soon. I wanted to announce it on that day, but it was essentially uh, a week later, but that's, that doesn't matter. Uh, we integrated then, we met some other partners, some new partners, we integrated end-to-end um, -end testing, we did RCS and Volta prepaid. Um, integration as a, as a proof of concept, as I was uh, talking about. So that's uh, something we, we've achieved. Um, we realigned after some learnings uh, in the beta, the product concept in Slovakia I did even an announcement. Uh, they made an announcement on Mobile World Congress that we're soon going to be integrating prepaid and Volt and all these things, and we're going to ramp it up. Uh, but essentially, um, that, that wasn't really working. Uh, we did some alignment of, uh, of our strategy then, uh, taking the issues that we were facing in Slovakia into account. Um, in April, uh, realigned again in May, it was a bit of a, of a tough time. Uh, started then to do the, the CPAS replacement POC, as I said, moved to an open source stack to also bring the footprint down uh, as, a, as a possibility to kind of um, gain a bit of an, of an upper hand in this discussion uh, of our future. Um, then it was decided to withdraw Magenta Talk, we deintegrated it the next month. Um, we were able to actually launch our product uh, with our own uh, open source based stack. So it was a kind of a small success, but nevertheless, yeah, we were shut down in, um, in July. Is that bad? Not, not really, because um, in the context of a carrier, we always talk about you need to fail fast, fail cheap. Uh, whether or not we fail cheap is, I would say, up to discussion. I, I think it was rather, rather okayish, but it was important to see. We look here, we had some issues, we, we couldn't solve them really, we couldn't address them properly, and it took really just, just three months until a decision was made. So it didn't drag on for years and years, which is, which is a good thing, actually, that it was that fast. Of course, it gave us a small window also to, to kind of change things, but when there's a certain point um, crossed and you can no longer do that, I, I think it's, it's fair to say that this was 
um, also a learning uh, how to, uh, you know, we, we got set up as a separate company to be shut down in case it doesn't work out. Um, and that's essentially what happened. So that's one of the outcomes all of us was actually knowing is going to happen. So now I want to summarize a bit of um, lessons learned from different viewpoints. First, the user viewpoint. Um, as I said, for carrier service, uh, services, it matters uh, if you touch a core business or, or um, new business areas. Um, yeah, when your main device behaves differently, that's not what people are really used to. Uh, when calls are all of a sudden signaled with an, with an app, Apple uh, push message or an Android, an Android push message, uh, it's a different thing, although you tell them before and although it has certain benefits also over how it usually works, um, uh, we, we were not able to manage, um, at, or, yeah, one of the lessons is you should manage uh, the behavior of edge cases, so of handovers, we essentially did not have the classic carrier handover from from 2G to 3G uh, to 4G, but we had handovers uh, between IP stacks. So as long as you had IP, 3G, 4G, Wi-Fi, you could go up and down, would always choose the best connectivity and always be connected, connected best. If a 4G calls goes to 3G and then 2G, you usually don't go up, back up to, to 3G and 4G. At least in, in Slovakia it was like this. So, so we had some benefits, but we didn't really, we didn't really manage them. Um, uh, it was working when there was no internet connection because essentially we would fall back to to, to classic circuit switch telephony, but all of that, um, from an experience point of view, uh, would have needed to be managed better. And uh, as I said, the revised business model for the millennial segment was essentially about uh, using minutes versus data. Um, uh, yeah, it's not. It's yeah. We should have simply, I think, um, zero rated it. But that was not a lesson that that led in, in the end to being being shut down. It's just one of the learnings. Uh, from a governance point of view. Um, one of the key messages I would say, uh, your stakeholders are not your friendly, your friendly users when you tamper with their main phones, apparently. Um, so none of us really, I'm, I'm not like all day on the phone, apparently many of the, of the managers we tried it with were. And with their main phone, although they knew that could happen, but it, when it really happens and they couldn't receive calls, um, even for just half a day, or they wanted to make a call and it just worked on a third attempt, that's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. They want to learn, but their span of, um, of patience is very, very small when it really involves their main device. The problem is if you don't use their main device, they wouldn't use it at all. So, in, in one, so we learned something from them as well, from the feedback, but essentially it led a bit also to, to being perceived as, as unstable, although I would say 95% of the scenarios where they had issues, um, yeah, where you were able to forecast that it, this is a special situation. And it was kind of, they start a call when they go to their car, so they go to the elevator, then they go in the car, in the, in the car parks, minus, minus third floor. They have, there are some scenarios you just need to, need to think of um, when you do that. And it's also important to have a balanced set of stakeholders, uh, technical and non-technical, so that essentially also technical achievements are, are being valued. Um, or criticized uh, with on eye level, basically. Uh, corporate versus non-corporate representation and also clear roles and responsibilities. Who's advising you? Whom are you delivering a product for? Um, and who wants to get something else out of it in a role as a strategic investor? Uh, the crisis view, um, essentially, yeah, when guidance is missing, look for something meaningful to do. So that's essentially why we did uh, also the, the CPaaS replacement uh, with open source. It was more of a thing to, to look at, can we do it? Can we put up our own stack? It was not yet ready for, for mass scalability. We, we would have still needed to learn if we would have really done it. But um, when we knew there is not really, you know, it's going to be assessed what is going to happen with the company and people sit just there and have nothing to do. It's always better to do something meaningful. And we really learned a lot during that time. So I, th I would always do that again. I look for something meaningful, uh, meaningful to do. Uh, it's very important for, for, for the team we had. And um, yeah, you know that termination can happen. That's why you have, that's why you're not an employee of the kind of uh, governing organization for us, DT. But we were employed with Immer. We had certain, um, there was an expectation that, uh, that it could happen. So, so um, uh, yeah, as, in retrospect, we should have looked earlier in the opportunities that gives us. Um, but it's always, I think, only possible if you're really aligned in the management and the team. Uh, Orange Libon did that, right? They spun out of Orange with the management and, and the key people. Um, we did not manage that, um, obviously. And do not rely on previous stakeholders for future scenarios. So whenever, whenever you see there's something happening and, and people have to decide certain things, um, whatever you do next, um, it's better to be decoupled from this. Um, 
Yeah, a post interview. So what happened actually? It was quite easy for most of us. We we had all good profiles. It would have been easy to find individual jobs. It was much harder, and some of you know that because we spoke, <laughs> to find alternatives for the team. So for me, it was quite important. Uh, everyone in the team could have found a job. That was not the issue. The issue was that we built up a team. Uh, it took a lot of effort. Uh, the, the expertise in the team was very specific. Uh, we had uh, key telco people that, that know kind of next-gen telco. We had developers that know just about enough for, from, a, from a telco perspective, but then focus on development. We had a lot of quality engineers that, you would, that we kind of built up, um, some junior ones, some very senior ones. Um, essentially, that's an expertise that is not that easy to find. So, so um, I still don't regret having, having looked for that, but it was really hard, and that's one of the reasons also why we ended up with DD, because they saw the value in the team and, and they, had, um, they had the means to, to, to get us back in. And um, I really like that, because essentially this, the, this delta that the individuals bring and that the team brought has, I think, a, a lot of value. Um, there was no press announcement um, from DT, nevertheless. Um, I think it's good to spread the word. Um, I did that on LinkedIn, many of you responded. It felt good and it also helped. Um, uh, I would do that again. Uh, it's, I think, um, yeah. It would be better if, if we would have kind of um, had something to refer to, but nevertheless, uh, if you talk about it and if you remain positive, um, uh, you know, and, and, and take it as lessons learned, and that's also what I'm trying to do now, to share these lessons, others um, can do better next time. And, and separate individuals from processes and, and decisions, decisions that are necessary. You always have kind of um, bad feelings here and there and think, what is this guy doing? But but it doesn't help you really. Um, sometimes it's uh, you need to you need to make that cut. So I, yeah, we were glad we had the opportunity given by DT. So thanks actually for that. A TED summit view uh, to summing up these lessons learned. I think also that everyone here, the community was actually uh, very helpful. So um, yeah, many of you responded on LinkedIn. We we've had discussions about potential future scenario. Alan introduced me here and there to people. That was really good. Thank you, uh, actually everyone. Uh, that felt good and it was also kind of a thing that, that I've started doing now. Whenever I see someone posting like he's looking for new experiences or he has a profile, I just like it or put a, put a short comment. It, it just feels good. It really, in that time, was not that easy, but it was a, it was, uh, it was a good thing to do. It doesn't take much. And um, essentially, I think our all our networks combined have really kind of an amplification factor that, that uh, people with, with, with good skills and um, yeah, can essentially get, uh, get set somewhere. Um, uh, I don't think it was yet another carrier failing. Of course, there's a certain bias because it was our kind of pet project, but I think we really did something that uh, hasn't been done like that before, or at least not in the way we did it. So connecting the old word with a, with a modern um, cloud native application stack, um, is a bit different approach than, than having, let's say, an IMS IP infrastructure, putting a WebRTC gateway in front of it and, and saying you do WebRTC or you, you do something new when you just offer a telephony. We also did that, but the, I think the coupling we had with the carrier was, uh, was done well uh, to interconnect backends, backend to backend, and to be really independent, uh, yet exposing carrier assets to, to generate value. Um, yeah, uh, we, we decoupled it from the GSMA complexity and dependencies that was also important. I always highlighted that the client server stack uh, does not need to be standardized as long as you, you uh, y let's say, uh, access the carrier assets uh, in a standardized way. Um, um, I really saw it also as doing the best of both worlds, removing each, uh, each stack's drawback. So we, we were uh, having interop that the carrier brings, uh, universal reach. Uh, lowest common denominator, of course, so if it was a phone call, it was just a phone call. If it was Volta, it was Volta, SMS, or RCS, or whatever the other, the other party had, but we, we had delivered this. And on the other hand, we had um, an uh, agile and innovative way of, of differentiating um, uh, on, the, on the user experience. It was very important. We had actually our own design team, we had our own product team, so all of, we put a lot of, uh, a lot of efforts there to really, to really be good in this differentiating experience. And I would say everyone that, that was joining the project uh, did grow during that time, uh, personally and also professionally. So summarizing, um, I would take three points with me. Don't, don't do generalizations. Uh, corporates are manifold, and, and even if you're disappointed, and of course every one of us was disappointed about the decision in the end, but that does not mean that, that uh, there is still potential to work together. Uh, we're the best sample. We, we went back to DT after you know, being, being shut down. It's, I would say it's, it's completely, um, in retrospect, um, a thing that we could all expect. Um, the only thing that I think is really regrettable is the brain drain overall, so that in the end only, only eight of, uh, out of 50 people in total um, went back there from all the skills we had. 
Um, could be done better, should be done better, but um, essentially that's how it is. And in the end, yeah, uh, I would have not wanted to miss it. I would do it again, exactly like this. Um, maybe take some learnings in, but um, I still it was it was a good experience. Also, not jump the ship when you could see there are some issues, but to really go through the whole process. It's just a learning that uh, that nobody can take away from you, actually. Um, so thank you for your attention. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sebastian. That was an excellent presentation. We have time for one question. Adam. All right, thanks for that. Uh, first of all, some empathy. We had exactly the same narrative with Ribbit when we bought it um, about 10 years or so ago. Um, and exactly the same story on all fronts. Um, the key point is, is trying to bring in different monetization models into a telco. You need to start there, and we didn't start there either. And that's what killed it in the end. We couldn't work out how to monetize it. Yep, thanks. Look, just one thing, Sebastian. I, th I said this to you privately yesterday. I want to say it in front of everyone. As an entrepreneur who's worked in telecoms for an awfully long time, I just want to, uh, and has seen the evolution of Emma from afar, um, I want to, one, absolutely congratulate you for having a go and for, and for taking the move and, and kicking it off. Two, I want to really, I mean, it's when you try and start something and you get constrained by environments and whether they're customers or investors or stakeholders, I think it takes a level of courage and maturity to actually want to talk about it. I'm glad you've done it every year at TAD, TAD, TAD Summit. So thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. Again, Sebastian, you'll be here for the rest of today. So uh, again, lots of uh, discussion there. Again, it resonates so strongly with so many of the challenges we've seen in innovation in telcos over the past couple of decades. And uh, you know, getting some of the senior managers to play with your uh, app is absolutely the worst thing you could possibly do. <laughs> Seriously. They are some of the worst audience. You've got to focus on the segment you're addressing. And that is actually just to highlight with Le Bon, because they've spun out, uh, they've raised cash. Um, you know, they've got a very clear focus on a segment of the market. It is not addressable to any of the Orange senior management. Uh, so as a result, that avoided that issue. So again, welcome to that. Great. <laughs>